Hi, I'm Michael Hennett. I'm the Director of Experience Design for Filter. And I'm here today with Aaron Bowersock, a senior UX designer on the Filter team. And we're here to talk about design systems today. So I'd like to touch on the, uh, the challenges that a lot of teams run into uh, when trying to build out a design language, a design system, or rolling it out across the enterprise, across their organization. Especially when there are multiple teams or multiple departments that they need to coordinate with when creating and, and getting it out in front of customers. So what, what kind of challenges have you seen teams run into? Yeah, so um, when, when I have done projects for some of these larger enterprises, uh, they may you know, add a feature or two here this year, next year they pick up another one, and uh, each time they might use a different dev team within the organization who builds their solution the way that they built it, which might be a little bit different than the, the first year did, and eventually they have uh, something that technically works, um, an engineer would probably be very happy with it, hey, it works, um, but yeah. maybe the end user is getting different experiences throughout uh, the entire software. Um, and that's not ideal because it can be a little jarring or they can say, oh, it worked like this over here. Um, why does it work like this on this feature? Aren't you the same company? Yeah. So while the company has put in a lot of work and created solutions that are functioning, um, we would try to argue that, well, the ideal solution is that you provide this seamless uh, experience and unified experience for the user. And that's where it gets a little tricky trying to convince people, mm -hmm. um, trying to convince leadership who have basically sunk a lot of time and money and they, they would argue that, uh, you know, these are working. Why would we go back and change it? Why would yeah. we fix what not, what's not broken? Um, but what they may not be considering is, you know, the, uh, the drop off of users who just get frustrated with something or... Mm -hmm. Um, users who feel lost in their solution. Um, maybe it is successful, but can we make it much more successful? Okay. And, and I, I think, yeah, yeah, I would I ask you the, how the do we piece, do that. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, bringing up the, the piece around not recognizing users who disappear, mm -hmm. right? And the, oh, let, why should we fix it if it's working, it's not broken? And I think with a lot of organizations, they don't necessarily see the part that's broken. Mm -hmm. Because when users disappear or don't renew or don't even sign up, don't buy, it's really hard for different parts of the organization to identify, well, why is that? What happened? Right? And um, I, I think that there's an amount of doing research to understand, well, why are people uh, dropping off or leaving and identifying and showing people showing the, the leadership through the organization, here are all the different parts that are not working together. Here is the actual experience that your customers are having. Because I think um, what I've seen a lot in organizations is that because they're very complicated, right, and they've broken up the organization into different silos and pieces to tackle mm -hmm. different parts of the customer experience, they really only see their own piece of the puzzle. And so by showing them, here's what the actual customer journey is like, it's kind of eye-opening to see hmm. what the experience the user actually has in interacting with different parts of the organization. So actually taking them out of their silos and saying, this is what exactly. the actual user is experiencing. Yeah, huh. yeah. Actually, actually showing them, mm -hmm. like, here's what it's like, and then, then recognizing how what they've been working on maybe doesn't connect to or is like really disjoint mm -hmm. from other parts of the organization, right? And really elevating the understanding of that so that they understand the value of fixing those and, and creating more uh, a more seamless experience, mm -hmm. like you said. And by, by branching out with this design system to kind of uh, adopt all these uh, different features into it, that kind of solves the problem. But how do you convince them that it's worth it overall? I mean, yeah, you yeah. see, sure, okay, well, I know this is kind of, kind of crummy experience, but how many are actually falling off? Um, how do you convince them that it's uh, 
economically sound to <laughs> adopt a massive design library. Yeah. And I, I think there's a couple of answers to that. Like one is really looking at, you know, some of those pieces of ROI. And, mm -hmm. and we touched a little bit about um, the teams, there's an acceleration that happens in the product teams. And so um, both from a design and a development perspective. So having those building blocks can help speed up the agility of the organization mm -hmm. and the ability to get new products and features out the door. Um, and certainly reducing kind of the initial investment in, uh, in product creation. Um, I think a lot of organizations for that, I have an existing solution mm -hmm. and why should I go and unpack it and, and effectively change it? Um, I think having them understand like pulling numbers and really providing some concrete data around some of the, the costs that are often a little bit hidden like if we think about the cost of managing multiple features, right, or m multiple versions of the same feature, right, um, and again, not just the development cost of that, which is not, you know, small, but the maintenance cost and the ongoing support costs. Um, there was some uh, research that was done by Forrester that looked at what does it cost to have a poorly designed feature or part of your product um, the monthly cost of support, and this is for a relatively normal feature when it drives support costs and um, calls or emails oh, yeah. or dealing with escalations, somewhere in the neighborhood of fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a month per feature that's broken. Okay, <laughs> and then um, the the third component to the cost that I think is hidden is the whole idea of debt. Right, we talk about design debt and technical debt, mm -hmm. which is effectively the, the code and the design that you work with that you know is not great, but you've created it, and you just kind of continue to build around it mm -hmm. and have to compromise other features and maintain that bad code, maintain that bad design. And again, what Forrester found was that the maintenance of debt was about $25,000 a month in just maintaining the development and design cost of poorly designed features yeah. in any particular product. Oh, that's interesting. So even that stuff, yeah, I, I wouldn't normally think of that. So you're losing yeah. a lot of money. You're losing a lot of money. And not to mention that you're losing a lot of opportunity to really build better and more innovative and differentiated products, right? Because all that time that you're spending working around debt or dealing with duplicative features, mm -hmm. Right, you're not actually creating anything new. You're not creating anything that's gonna make incrementally more value and impact to customers. Mm -hmm. And so you've lost an opportunity in the market to differentiate yourselves. And that's that's really almost the biggest cost. Yeah. And it's one that's really hard to uh, quantify, like what the lost opportunity in the, in the market is. But I think if you talk to any of the leadership or any product, you know, senior product or senior marketing folks, mm -hmm. that they will identify very quickly, hey, if your yeah. team is spending, say, 25% of their time maintaining poor design solutions or technical debt instead of investing in new innovation, mm -hmm. do you want that or do you not want that? Yeah. What would it be worth to you to get rid of that and be able to spend 25% more time on innovation? Yeah. I think that that's a huge sell, and, and, but it's these hidden costs that I think companies are, don't necessarily recognize. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think as part of the way that we look at and help our stakeholders think about design and, and design operationalization as well as good, consistent, coherent design is to think about, well, what are the underlying numbers that get impacted and how do you build that business case to really drive the initiative forward? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like... Pretty compelling argument to uh, like adopt um, yeah. some version of a new design system. Yeah, and I think for a lot of people that are you know on design teams that are looking to think about how doing a uh, design system and rolling it out and really um, focusing on that effort, you know, even without the specific numbers, mm -hmm. but just recognizing all the different parts of the organization that get impacted and thinking about oh. 
this can help us with support. Mm -hmm. This can help us um, with speed and with adoption and with keeping customers engaged in our products and reducing, you know, we think about learnability as a key kind of measure of overall usability, mm -hmm. right? And um, being able to drive that forward through consistent design that is built on a design system that works. The other thing that that highlights though is for teams that are looking to build design systems mm -hmm. is really looking across the organization and identifying what other parts, what other teams should be involved. Uh, because you do want it to be uh, you know, a company-wide effort mm -hmm. when you think about how both you think about the patterns that you need in the design system, but also who should be involved in how, who are your partners in driving that forward. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of times I see um, little incubations of it that are not harnessing the rest of the organization effectively. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's a key um, component to really driving it across the organization is to really reach out and to build the relationships and bring those people, bring those other stakeholders into mm -hmm. the fold and into the process. Uh, yeah, you can have the best idea in the world, but unless you get other people with you, championing it out to other departments, um, how, are they, how is it really going to get adopted? How are you going to find success? Yeah. Um, and when you bring in these other people from all different departments, from dev, business stakeholders, uh, other leadership to champion it, um, you really get a really rounded look at what we all imagine this product is, what we imagine it should be, um, throw in a lot of user research and figure out what right. the users uh, want, what the users right. are benefiting from now, where their pain points, and then I think once we do get that buy-in, you can create a really successful design system that mm -hmm. hits all the goals that you set out to hit. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I like the fact, um, so it's great that you brought up the question of like, how do I know it's working? Mm -hmm. What is, like there's the testing component, right? So we always want to do usability testing and kind of validation testing. But even once it starts getting rolled out into, kind of into the customer's hands mm -hmm. out in the wild, um, an area that um, I've seen teams struggle is how do I put metrics and measurement? How do I do analytics around it to see, am I getting the change that I want, right? Is, is it being successful? Um, and working with the different analytic teams and folks who are responsible for tracking behavior or tracking usage and really identifying, hey, are there additional metrics and measures that you can put in place to determine, oh, okay, is this thing really having the impact that I want? Are mm -hmm. people really using it? And are is the like the support or the usability around it going down? Mm -hmm. Frequently, what I what I've seen is that there is then work to be done with different parts of the organization that track those kinds of things, track issues, bugs, or complaints, so that you can then classify it as, oh, okay, this is a usability problem, mm -hmm. or this is associated with this kind of component or this kind of engagement so that you can see where you're actually having an impact. And that can be really hard, um, but it's really essential to then kind of close that loop around, we did the investment to make this change. And then being able to come back and say, we did make the change and here's what we saw. Mm -hmm. And then the case for the next iteration becomes so much easier because you can show that you actually made a change for real customers and made a real business impact. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's, that's definitely an area where a lot of teams don't go all the way to the KPIs and the metrics around yeah. the change in customer behavior that, um, that I think mature organizations eventually get to and are able to track, hey, the investment that we're doing in this design is really leading to these business mm -hmm. outcomes and we mm -hmm. can actually measure it. Thanks for uh, joining us to listen in about design systems. Uh, if you want to know more about design systems and all the work that we do at Filter in the experience design and multi-channel marketing space, check out our blog, come to our site, or better yet, contact us uh, and uh, get in touch and we'll talk with you about the things that we can do for your organization.